my name is Rob Shank, and I'm excited to welcome Alex Kershaw today. This Saturday, June 6th, will be the 76th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy. And to discuss that historic moment and the Medal of Honor recipients from that historic day, we're excited to welcome Alex. Alex is an acclaimed and award-winning author of several New York Times best-selling books about World War II, including The Bedford Boys, The Longest Winter, The Few, Escape from the Deep, and The Liberator. And uh, exciting news from Alex that The Liberator will be a Netflix special uh, debuting next year. Alex is a graduate from the University College of Oxford, and he's worked as a journalist for The Guardian and other newspapers before moving to the United States in 1994. But his latest book is The First Wave, The D-Day Warriors Who Led the Way to Victory in World War II. It was first published last year, and the paperback version came, just came out. Here's my copy here. Uh, so really, again, hopefully for all of you who haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. And again, we're going to talk about this book and a lot of the great uh, history and uh, personal stories that are a part of it. So Alex, first off, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. It's great to be with you. I hope you guys are well. I hope you're uh, enjoying the weather down there. We are. It's getting a little bit warm, but, <laughs> uh, but good. So, Alex, maybe let me first start. I mean, you obviously authored a lot of fantastic books. What attracted you to writing about the D-Day landings in the Normandy invasion? Um, I've always been fascinated by the story of D-Day. Um, both of my grandfathers served in World War II. Uh, one of them was killed in 1943, and um, I became fascinated by many aspects of D-Day. I wrote a biography of Robert Kappa. You probably know uh, who Robert Kappa was. He was the life photographer who took the most famous images of, of uh, Omaha Beach. The one, 11 of them uh, appeared in Life magazine, and I wrote a biography of Kappa, and when I was on Omaha Beach researching his finest hour, which was... Uh, him being in the first wave on easy red sector of Omaha Beach on June the 6th, 1944. I walked along the beach and I got to one end of Omaha Beach and there was a National Guard memorial there. And I thought to myself, this is back in 1999, before 9-11, I thought to myself, what the hell is a concrete, ugly memorial to a bunch of weekend warriors doing on <laughs> Omaha Beach? And I thought that all these guys were like crack troops. They were rangers. They were like the British commandos, right. extremely well trained. And it turned out that the um, only unit on Omaha Beach that landed on place on time, on five and a half miles of that beach, was, a, was Company A from the 116th Infantry Regiment, the 29th Division. And they're a bunch of farm boys from rural Virginia <laughs> that had joined the National Guard in the late 1930s. So, you know, 1938, 39, to make some money, you know, hang out with their buddies, go to Virginia Beach and have a good time in the summer for a week. You know, June the 6th, 1944, they're in the first wave of the most critical assault, you could argue, in history. And of the 200 guys in Company A, 34 were from, still from Bedford, Virginia. And of those 34, 19 were killed. And that's the highest uh, per capita loss of any American and, in fact, allied community on D-Day. So I thought, oh, my God, I didn't. This is a, an extraordinary story of sacrifice and heroism. But in the book, I tried to tell the story of the community back at home and how the loss of all those guys impacted that very small, you know, typical American rural community in World War II. So that got me interested. And then I thought, oh, my God, well, what can I possibly say that would be new about D-Day 75 years later? And I thought, well, not much, but I'm just going to pick my favorite stars, uh, the guys that I thought really got the job done. Um, they led the most critical missions. And I picked 10 characters all through, uh, you know, one character for every beach, one character for the airborne operations. And I thought to myself, well, these, if these 10 guys, these junior officers, these, these guys that um, had the, the biggest jobs to do that went first, if they had failed, what would have happened to the entire operation? And I really believe that, you know, you can boil it down to individual cases. Certainly on Omaha Beach, we can talk about these key guys that received the Medal of Honor and others, you really can boil down this massive, massive operation over 150,000 Allied troops, over 73,000 American soldiers on D-Day. And you can pick out certain individuals and cherry pick and say, well, if this person hadn't done the job, if they hadn't succeeded, things could have gone very badly wrong. 
Well, Alex, let me start there because I think that's one of the really the great strengths of your book is really featuring on these these important decision makers, these important uh, uh, people who really made a true difference in the Normandy landings. So let, let me start in chronologically because the first allies to essentially uh, land in Normandy are the airborne troops. And so maybe yeah. you could quickly highlight not only uh, you have Major John Howard, Otway, Lilliman kind of play these key roles, but tell our audience a little bit what the airborne troops there were doing and what those individuals were specifically doing. Yeah, sure, definitely. I'll show you, uh, I'll show you one guy. Um, can you see this guy? It's uh, Captain Frank Lilliman. He's a, a Pathfinder. He led the Pathfinder, the first stick that uh, jumped out of plane one. So he jumped out of a C-47 at 12.15 a.m. on June the 6th, 1944. There he is there, 101st Airborne, screaming eagle patch on his shoulder. Unusual and rare uh, color shot that's taken just a couple of days after D-Day. A beautiful carbine there that I love to fire whenever right. I get the chance. And there he is again. Now, his, he led the Pathfinders, and their job was to lay out beacons and lights and radar to guide in the main sky train of Screaming Eagles. That's six and, six and a half thousand men. So he lands at 12.15, and by 12.47 a.m., um, he has the lights and the beacons set up and ready to go. And then the first of that main body of men, six and a half thousand men from the 101st Airborne, they started to land in Normandy around 12.50 a.m. on D-Day. But officially, in 1944, um, he was named as the very first American to put his boots on the ground in Normandy on D-Day. Plane 1, uh, Pathfinder commander, um, was badly injured later on on the 6th of June. Uh, they were sent in a supply train. Uh, a lot of um, ammunition and material was needed. And and as dusk fell on June the 6th, he was there to welcome that uh, supply um, flight and was badly injured by shrapnel and shot up by the Germans and was sent back to England uh, on the 7th of June. Uh, when AWOL, uh, something of a bad boy from upstate New York, and when AWOL rejoined his unit, the 101st Airborne, um, the 502nd PIR, and fought all the way through Normandy, uh, and then also uh, was at uh, Market Garden in September 1944, and actually at Bastogne too, wow. in December of 1944, and then, a lot of combat. yeah, went all the way through the end of the war. But anyway, he's, um, he's uh, it's a great story, because if these guys hadn't set up those lights, and they were under enormous pressure, uh, you know, flying across the English Channel, uh, a complete blackout, jumping, um, from only about 350 feet, we think. Uh, Lindemann said that it took him 22 seconds from the time that, that he jumped out of the C-47 to when his boots hit the ground. Um, so the C-47, some of them were going at well over 100, well over 100 miles an hour. Um, he, he, he had a pretty hard landing. He, um, he injured himself. He had an, a ruptured Achilles from uh, a practice jump uh, weeks before and that he aggravated that uh, but if he hadn't point is if he hadn't succeeded if they hadn't set those lights up if they hadn't been into being able to guide in the 101st airborne to drop zone a in normandy uh things could have gone pretty badly wrong for the airborne operation which was confused and chaotic as it was anyway and alex as you put on the book and i think a lot of americans have a, a great focus on the 101st and 82nd but as you point out in your book, there's also really an important airborne landing on the other end of the Normandy landings done by the British. If you sure. Like those uh, key contributions. Yeah, well, we have, uh, I'll show you a, a pretty interesting couple of images here. Go through this pretty quickly. Um, so the 6th Airborne had the eastern uh, flank of that 50-mile bridgehead way over on the west, uh, near St. Mary Glees and behind Utah Beach, you had Frank Lindemann and the 101st Airborne and also the 82nd Airborne, of course. That's some, uh, over 17,000 American troops dropping from the air. But over on the eastern flank, about 50 miles away, uh, not far from Wistraham, you have Pegasus Bridge, the Orne River and the Khan Canal. And here are three gliders. If you look carefully, um, you'll see the three gliders. They contained men from the 
uh, Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, famously led by Major John Howard. Each of those gliders uh, contained 30 men, and uh, believe it or not, they were set free around about midnight. Uh, they were hauled, guided across the English Channel by Halifax bombers, and then they were set free around midnight, and they crash landed at 90 miles per hour, having come down from around 5,000 feet. Now the pilots, the pilots of these gliders had a stopwatch and a compass. They didn't have any radar, they had no electronic guiding systems like today. This is an extraordinary feat. And if you look at the front, the, 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 the plane that's nearest to this gash here, the, the road, the bridge is just down to the lower left. Um, the front glider containing John Howard landed maybe 30 yards from the target Pegasus Bridge. Uh, Lee Mallory, who was head of the Allied Air Forces on D-Day, said that what you're looking at here, these three gliders landing um, so close to the bridge, and in particular the, the front glider, which was piloted by Jim Walwick, that this is the greatest single act of flying of World War II. It was absolutely extraordinary to be able to land that close to Pegasus Bridge, which was a key objective. Uh, they landed around 12, 15 a.m., so there's a big debate. Who was the first American first, first, to... Right. Who was the first Allied troop, to soldier rather, to, to, to land on D-Day? Now, they landed around the same time, maybe seconds apart from Lilliman and his guys, so the Brits and the Americans are kind of tied on this. In fact, the first uh, Allied soldier to land on D-Day was a member of the British SAS, one SAS, was a guy called Norman Poole, and he landed at 12.12 12 a.m. as part of a decoy unit near St. Mary Glees. But anyway, this is a, a picture of St. Mary Glees. That's Jim Walwick. He was the pilot of the first glider you saw there nearest to the bridge. And there he is with John Howard back at Pegasus Bridge. Oh, wow. Walwick is on the left, on my left rather. And then you have uh, Major John Howard there with the... Uh, with that beret on his head, that's I think 1994. It really is, as, as you have in the book, uh, it's really one of the more exciting parts. And again, such a crucial yeah. part of the of the strategy, the Allied strategy. Again, what were those uh, glider troops? What was really their chief role there? Why did they land at Pegasus Bridge? Uh, they needed the. If, if you look at a map on D-Day, if you look at Pegasus Bridge, it crosses the Khan Canal, and there's the Orne River close by. Now we needed to control both of those. Uh, waterways to prevent the Germans from crossing them in a counterattack. So we we dropped uh, over six and a half the Khan Canal and the um, and the Orne uh, rivers there. Um, if there was going to be a serious counterattack by the Germans on D-Day, it would come from it was guaranteed to come from that direction. If we could mop up the British troops holding Pegasus Bridge and the, and the, the Khan Canal, then the Germans would have a, a direct strike into Sword and Gold Beaches. So that it would have been a very, very serious problem indeed if we'd not controlled those two, two waterways. And in fact, if you look at the Battle of Normandy, some of the most fierce fighting, and I would argue as a limey, I'm being biased here, that in the couple of weeks after D-Day, the toughest fighting actually occurred on the, what are called the Orne River Heights. That's a, a series of hills looking down on Pegasus Bridge just to the east. Um, if the Germans had been able to take those heights, which were fought over very fiercely, by, mainly by British commandos and the Oxen Bucks and other units, if the Germans had taken those heights, they could have shelled everything that was uh, alive uh, below or along, about 20, 30 miles along that, that uh, flimsy Allied bridgehead. So very fierce fighting there, and we had to secure those key objectives to prevent the Germans from striking at uh, the main Allied forces on Sword and Gold Beach. So Alex, let's now switch over to the beach landing. So most uh, students of the battle know there were five different beaches that the Allies landed on. The one that appeared to be um, the most difficult of the five was Omaha Beach. And in your book, you do highlight a number of really key individuals who play a role in overcoming the real you know, terrible defenses that they faced there on Omaha. So I don't know if you can kind of highlight a little bit about Lieutenant John Spaulding and Sergeant uh, Phil Strezik, who seemed to play a really key role in, in the success there in the end. Yeah, I'm just going to show you a picture of, uh, sorry, I'm being a little bit um, 
so here we go. There you go. Um, this is uh, Lieutenant John Spaulding. It's a high school shot of him, and he led uh, the first platoon of E Company of the 16th Infantry Regiment of the Big Red One. And he landed at H hour on Easy Red Sector. That's one of eight sectors on Omaha Beach. It was the second deadliest sector. The most deadly sector was uh, Dog Green, where the Bedford boys landed, over 90% casualties. But E Company suffered over 60% casualties on Easy Red Sector. It wasn't easy at all. Uh, easy Red's just below the uh, Colville Samir graveyard today in Normandy. And this guy here landed in the first wave, obviously, um, under intense machine gun fire, nearly drowned in a runnel along Omaha Beach. Um, he and most of his men uh, removed their packs as soon as they possibly could. He said that he was, the water was very cold and it weighed him down, uh, made his uniform feel like lead. Anyway, he managed somehow, miraculously, to get onto the beach. And he and Strezik, uh, here, seeing uh, uh, Sergeant Phil Strezik here, being, being decorated by Montgomery. Uh, I know that's great, remarkable. Great, uh, best, the best general of World War II, as we know. Being a Brit, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Don't this, tell is after, this is after D-Day, but you know, he, he's being given the DSC here. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, there were 153 Americans for, um, that were awarded the DSC for actions on Omaha Beach alone. Only four Medal of Honours. I don't know why, but uh, well, we can talk about that later. And coming back to um, Spalding here, these two guys fought together. In fact, some people say that Strezik here did most of the uh, gave most of the orders that day. He'd been in Sicily, been a, uh, received the Silver Star in Sicily, and was a, a hell of a fighter. Um, some say the best guy in the 16th Infantry Regiment on D-Day and and for the rest of the war. Uh, but anyway, together, they managed to take the first platoon. Uh, Spalding here had never seen combat before, Strezik had. And so therefore, at key moments uh, in the first minutes after landing, Strezik made key decisions. Lieutenant Spalding echoed them. But anyway, as a team, they worked together they, and they managed to lead the first platoon off Omaha Beach. So uh, Spalding here uh, has the great honor of uh, being the first American officer to lead Americans off bloody Omaha, where over 900 were killed. He got to the top of the bluffs above Easy Red Sector around about eight o'clock in the morning. So it took him an hour and a half from when the ramp came down to actually be able to break out of uh, the beach. Uh, now, I wanted to bluffs. ask you, I mean, when you compare Omaha to the other American beach, Utah, yeah, there are ten times the number of casualties at Omaha, sure, as compared to Utah. Now you've led a lot of battlefield tours here. You've walked this ground. I mean, why was there such a great disparity between those two beaches? Uh, well, Utah. Um, several historians have come up with a figure of 197 casualties. So that's killed, missing, and wounded. That's not 197 fatalities. And on Omaha, we have over two and a half thousand casualties 900 killed as I said so you're right 10 times the the uh, the fatalities 10 times the the casualties now there are two main reasons for this number one is that Utah uh, we we carpet bombed it so accurately that we destroyed most of the significant German defenses uh, we also got very lucky that we mislanded the uh, the fourth division mislanded by about a mile on Utah and where the fourth division landed the main strong point had literally been completely obliterated by uh, 9th Air Force. Uh, 300, over 320 uh, Liberator bombers had actually done a very good job on Utah. Um, it was an extraordinarily effective bombing. Uh, Miss Landing, which was at the time seen as being uh, a terrible thing for, not, not for too long actually, because Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. from the 4th Division famously said, we'll start the war from here even though we were a mile away from where they should have been. So great carpet bombing, uh, luck, and the shape of the beach. If you go to the beach, you'll see the topography is really important. There are not 100 foot high bluffs like there are on Omaha. The beach at Utah isn't shaped like a crescent, which allowed you to be shot in the back, literally on Omaha if you landed there. Um, and also we bombed, critically, this is where it's very important, we bombed along Utah like that, parallel right. to the beach. So if, right. if one bomb missed one target, it would hit probably another. Uh, and in fact, one out of six bombs 
dropped on Utah, hit their targets. Compare that to Omaha, where we went like that, we bombed like that. Now, if you asked any pilot or anybody with any common sense, if you're over 5,000 feet, there's cloud cover below you, and you've been told to time your bomb drop by a vital few seconds so that the bombs won't drop on troops below you, that you won't have friendly fire, that you drop them just as you move in land, um, guess how many bombs we actually dropped accurately and guess how many German defences we destroyed in the pre-invasion bombing uh, of Omaha? Yeah, very Zero. good. As you point out in the account, the uh, soldiers were told that the defences would be destroyed and yet they're yeah. not when they get there. Yeah, well, an, agent, an, an American naval intelligence officer said that not a single defensive ob object was hit and destroyed by American bombing just before the first troops arrived. Uh, on Omaha Beach, not just before, but in the hours before H hour, which was 6.30 a.m. on June the 6th, 1944. So yeah, a disaster, a bloody disaster. Uh, you, you're right, they were told that there would be, uh, the Bedford boys who landed on Omaha were told that there would be massive cratering, that they all, most of the Germans would have run, run away. They would have been so terrified by this uh, apocalyptic bombing that there would have been shell, the, um, holes in the beach, craters in the beach to, to shelter. And the, the, the main fighting would start the next day when they got inland. And as we know, it was quite the opposite. They, uh, they literally walked into a, uh, a firing range and a slaughterhouse. So Alex, let's switch. Now, um, as we mentioned earlier, there are four Medal of Honor recipients from D-Day proper, June 6, 1944. And three of them, maybe not surprising, just given what you shared, are from Omaha Beach. So Jimmy Monteith, Joe Pinder and Carlton Barrett. So maybe we can talk about those three, what they were doing on Omaha, and maybe what, what merited kind of them receiving the Medal of Honor. Yeah, well, here you have um, one of the guys. This is uh, Pinder. He, uh, he was killed, actually. Uh, only one of these guys survived, and that was uh, Carlton Barrett. Um, so this is Pinder. All belonged to the big red one, um, and he was. Uh, um, he carried a radio and uh, that made him a target. Uh, he was hit badly and then while he was in the shallows on Omaha Beach, he managed to retrieve his radio set and a couple of others. And the point being is that the reason why I think he was recognized is because he went continually back to the waterline to retrieve equipment and communications equipment. So it was very important that we had as good communication as possible from the, the beach to the American Navy offshore because only with that kind of clear communication could men like Pinder pinpoint for the US Navy the key German defenses. Uh, later on in the morning, like so 9.30 onwards on June the 6th, 1944, the American Navy was extraordinarily accurate and very, very destructive. Uh, literally, as soon as guys like this, like Pinder, uh, uh, labeled a position and called in the naval fire, um, the German defenses were destroyed. So he was very brave. He was uh, under wave after wave of machine gun bullets and uh, managed to um, retrieve important communication equipment, uh, which yeah. made a big difference. And I was reading um, those, uh, those radios again, 45 pounds. So they were not like light radios today. Yeah. Now here we have uh, the oldest general officer on D-Day. He was 56 years old. This is Theodore Roosevelt Jr. Um, made famous obviously from the movie The Longest Day. Now he landed on Utah in the first wave, literally in the first wave. He was with F Company from the 8th Infantry Regiment of the 4th Division. And um, I uh, came across an interview with a star of my book, The First Wave, a guy called Leonard Schroeder, who was a good friend of his. Um, um, Roosevelt used to call Schroeder Moose because he was so muscular. He was a, a <laughs> football player from the University of Maryland. Anyway, Schroeder said Schroeder was officially the first American to wade ashore on D-Day at 6.28 a.m. on Utah. And uh, Schroeder said that he looked over to his right and about 150 yards away, guess what? This, this old man was hobbling and huffing and puffing his way across Utah Beach with his walking stick literally leading the way in the first wave. He begged to be there. He'd been turned down twice before and finally got his way because he was obviously very well connected, being the son of uh, one of your greatest ever presidents. And uh, 
fought very valiantly on, on the 6th of June, 1944, and then uh, he landed with it. He shouldn't have been there for all sorts of reasons, mainly because of his health. He had very, a very dicky heart and arthritis. Uh, the war had really taken its toll on him. Let's not forget that he was with the um, first division before the fourth, and he'd been in North Africa and Sicily. So he, he really, his body had taken a beating, uh, and certainly um, his heart was, uh, was, was not good. And tragically, he had a heart attack on the 12th of July, 1944, and died. He literally died minutes after he'd seen his son, um, and his son actually landed on Omaha Beach with the first division, believe it or not. Um, and he was, uh, so we, don't, we, we know that he wasn't awarded Sorry, he didn't receive the Medal of Honor posthumously because of what he did on Utah Beach. It was the bravery he showed not, not only on Utah, but throughout the Normandy campaign up until that point where he died on the 12th of July. So that was, you know, almost, uh, almost two months of extremely tough fighting that, that he was in the middle of, in the thick of. Um, and he's buried today. I think we have a, that's Jimmy Monteith, who was um, from Virginia. There, there he is on the far left, look, with, uh, with Patton to the far right. This is uh, Roosevelt, and that's in North Africa. And uh, there you have his grave today in Colville Samir. And you'll note the gold, the gold star, which is uh, um, given for all those that uh, received the Medal of Honor. And he's buried with 9,500-odd other Americans lying in eternal peace at Colville Samir, and if you were to look slightly to the left here, they actually, his brother was killed in World War I, and they moved his brother's grave to be beside him in, uh, in Normandy. So, um, extraordinary man. Yeah, and, and you know, I heard, I read that Omar Bradley uh, thought that his action of landing on, on Utah Beach was one of the most heroic acts he had ever witnessed, so I thought that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and then, as you kind of showed, Jimmy Monteith is also there, kind of not far from John Spaulding. Uh, he seems to play somewhat of a similar role. Yeah, he was, um, he uh, actually um, was uh, an, an important figure on D-Day because uh, what happened with him was that he landed on the um, furthest section to the east on Omaha Beach, that's Fox Green sector. And he took out a strong point called Strong Point 61, it was one of 12 really uh, seriously well-defended German strong points. The strong points had, usually had several machine guns, mortars, and um, even 88 millimeter artillery pieces. And his unit from the Big Red One, again, he was from the uh, 16th Infantry Regiment of the Big Red One, his unit seized strong point number 61. And as they seized the unit, uh, seized the strong point. Unfortunately, the Germans counterattacked, surrounded him and his men, and while he led the breakout, while he tried to break out from that encirclement, he was killed. So he's one of the uh, three guys who received the Medal of Honor, all from the Big Red One on Omaha Beach. Um, now, what's interesting about Monteith is, apart from the fact that he's a, a Virginia Tech graduate and uh, a very celebrated and revered one, is that he actually uh, was um, recommended for the Medal of Honor, and there were so many recommendations for men to receive the Medal of Honor for their actions on Omaha Beach that an evaluation board in Washington, D.C. downgraded several of the recommendations to DSCs. So Monteith would have received, would have been the 154th, if you like, guy to receive the DSC uh, for actions on Omaha Beach. But at the intervention of Allied Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower, who actually looked at the file, the recommendation for Monteith, uh, Eisenhower said that there was no way that this guy should have received the DSC for his actions. He should, in fact, receive the Medal of Honor. So this is a case of Jimmy Monteith, whose DSC was up upgraded to right. what he should have received, the Medal of Honor. And there are several other cases of guys that should have received the Medal of Honor, but didn't on Omaha Beach. Because when you think about it, uh, you know, there's almost 30,000 American troops landed on Omaha Beach. The very nature of just getting off that beach took enormous courage. There were untold acts of incredible courage that morning. And for only three men to receive uh, the highest award for, 
for courage that day seems to be a little bit uh, unfair. Really Although, is. as a Brit, I should say that, you know, um, we only had one award, which is equivalent to the Medal of Honor, which is the Victoria Cross. So out of the over, over 55,000 Brits, uh, we only had one guy. At least you guys had four. <laughs> <laughs> Sergeant Major Hollis, which is also one of the figures. Yeah, books. Stanley Hollis. So he's the Victoria Cross recipient from that same battle. I mean, I, I think this is a really interesting point, Alex. And, you know, reading the, these accounts and reading about the bravery of, you know, first of all, either landing in a plane, landing in a glider, landing on a beach strewn with mines and, and, and assaulted by artillery and machine gun bullets, to think what some of these brave men did. And to think that there's only four medals of honor here is kind of remarkable. And, and I think you even you have some pretty strong words even in your book, you know, talking about how you just think that this is, you know, you know, unjust. And I think particularly in the case of Spalding and Strezik, I mean, Strezik sure. ends the war. I can't remember if the number is uh, how many silver stars and bronze stars, but this is a man who's been fighting from North Africa, sure. on, who, who, you know, I think someone said it, if uh, these guys didn't get the Medal of Honor, then no one should. I mean, it's, it's kind of remarkable that they didn't get the nation's highest honor, but say Jimmy Monteith, who by every uh, description deserves it, did. It does seem a very interesting kind of subject. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you look at World War II, as you well know, um, guys, usually received the Medal of Honor because they were part of a key action on a key day. So, you know, whether it was a breakout at Anzio, whether it was a D-Day anywhere in Europe, and let's not forget that there were, there were, there were five D-Days before D-Day um, in Europe from North Africa through Sicily, Italy, etc. So the, when you look at the number, I think there were something like, is it 434? You can correct me, 434 Medal of Honors. Uh, handed out in World War II. Um, I think that if you look at the circumstances, often it was to reward not just extraordinary courage and going beyond what we could expect in terms of normal, uh, you know, dutiful behavior. The, they, were, they were rewarded for their intrepidity and their extraordinary courage going beyond the call of duty. But also they were rewarded because they did key things that mattered to the overall plan of battle. So, for example, the reason why I think it's unjust, so unjust for the guys on Omaha that uh, had their medals downgraded was that had those guys not performed those acts of great courage, and it was usually leading men into the line of fire and succeeding in taking out German defensive installations, just like Spalding and Strezik, had those guys not done that, then D-Day could have failed. We, at one point, around about 11 o'clock in the morning on the 6th of June, 1944, Omar Bradley was seriously considering pulling American troops off Omaha Beach. So that would have meant the 1st Division and the 29th Division, 30,000 guys, pull out. What would that have done to the overall overlord plan for D-Day if we pulled American troops off that one of two beaches where Americans landed? It, it, I think it would have been a disaster. I think that we would have, that D-Day would have been a, a loss, not a win for the Allies. But the guys that made a difference, and this is where it's important, the guys that made a difference on Omaha Beach you could argue that maybe it's three or four dozen sergeants, junior officers like Strezik and Spalding, three or four dozen of those guys who made the biggest difference, who actually had the courage to get up and lead their men into enemy fire, withering machine gun fire, and push those men, scream at them, shout at them, and lead them off that beach. Had they not led those men off that beach, Omaha Beach, as I said, could have been a, a significant disaster. So to not reward those guys who had the great courage, but had the great courage at the right time, at the critical time, seems to me to be very unfair. Because that's what we really should be doing when we give out medals. We should be rewarding people for enormous courage, but we should also be saying that these are examples. This is why the medal matters. This is why it's important, because we need people like this to win wars. We need guys to give everything and go way, way beyond what we would normally expect of any soldier. We need them in critical moments because they're the ones, they are the ones that make the biggest difference. They're the ones that win us battles and wars. Alex, this is great. So we've had a number of questions come in and I thought I'd choose some of these for you. And again, uh, I did want to kind of highlight that Alex is going to be autographing 
uh, several of his books. So if your question gets asked, uh, we'll hopefully be sending you one of these great books. If you don't already have it, it's a fantastic read. So Harold asks about uh, Operation Fortitude in some of the uh, deceptions that the Allies undertook. Alex, do you feel like that played a significant part in the success there in Normandy? Yeah, it definitely did. I mean, when it comes to, to simplify this, the Germans knew we were coming. They didn't know exactly when and where. It, it could have been in the Pas de Calais opposite uh, Dover, it's 23 miles of the English Channel. That was the obvious place to cross, perhaps. Uh, and, or it could have been Normandy. The point was that the Germans didn't know exactly where we were going to come and when. They, so they had to split their forces. Well, half the German forces were further away from Normandy. They were up near the Pas de Calais, two or 300 miles away. And then they left uh, sufficient forces, they thought, to be able to repel a landing in Normandy. But the point is that the, all the German forces weren't concentrated in one area. So we took them by surprise, crucially, although they reacted very, very fast within two or three days. We had a hell of a battle going on in Normandy. But importantly, we enjoyed the element of surprise and we split their forces and they couldn't throw everything they had at us in the first few hours. Had Rommel, who commanded the German forces on D-Day in Normandy, had he had his way, he would have put panzer divisions all along the Normandy coastline and we would have been shot out of the water before we even stood a chance of seeing the bluffs, let alone getting at them. Um, so thank goodness, yeah, again, that for, uh, for the fact that Hitler was a complete madman and micromanaged almost every battle that was significant in World War II. <laughs> From all the way through, he made very, very bad mistakes. Um, he was a failed artist and a, uh, a bad soldier and a, <laughs> an even worse general and strategist. <laughs> Thank goodness for us, because if Rommel and others had had their way at key points throughout World War II, uh, it would have been a very different outcome. So yeah, Fortitude was a very, made a big difference. It was a, a massive allied intelligence effort and I believe it was very successful. You know, we kept them guessing. They didn't know when and where we were going to come exactly. So Dwayne asked about the Maisie gun battery and why was it overlooked as a key objective uh, during the initial attacks? Well, this is, a, this is a little bit of a red herring here. I don't want to go on about this too much because there's quite a bit of controversy about the Maisie battery. Um, but uh, I don't think it was... Uh, overlooked. I think that the main story to tell here is about Point de Hoc and the Rangers and the success of that operation. There's been, you know, the, the Maisie battery is a, is a controversial subject, but um, I, don't, I don't think anybody could say it was overlooked. Um, the, the main strategic objective in that area of the Normandy coastline was uh, Point de Hoc, and we took it successfully thanks to the great courage of the second Ranger Battalion. Uh... Jeff also asks about the Higgins boats that were used in the D-Day landings, and he wants particularly to know about the Brits who were driving the Higgins boats. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we had the, um, the, the, the Royal Air Force, the British Royal Air Force were, so we had the British Navy and the, and, and the RAF uh, were both on Omaha Beach. Can you believe that? There's actually a memorial near the National Guard Memorial on Omaha Beach to the, the Brits and the RAF. Um, Jimmy Green was a 21-year-old civil lieutenant. He, 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 he was the flotilla commander for Company A. So he actually landed the Bedford Boys, 21-year-old guy, uh, flotilla of six landing craft. And uh, he landed those guys in exactly the right place at the right time. And he was British. You have to remember the Brits, the British Navy landed all of you guys on Omaha. Uh, <laughs> we, did a really, we did a really good job and we lost, lost a fair few lives. Um, I think it's a beautiful example of Allied cooperation uh, what's interesting is that the guy, the, uh, the flotilla commander, who, whoever the Brit was in the boat, the coxswain, the, whoever it was in the landing craft, the Higgins boat, uh, they had complete authority. So you could have been a general. You could, in fact, um, Rudder, when he came in uh, with the uh, second rangers uh, towards Point de Hoc, um, he, he had to take orders until the ramp came down from a Brit in the boat that was guiding the boat. And he, Famously, Rudder had a bit of an issue with this British guy because he thought he didn't know where the hell he was going and he didn't. And Rudder superseded him in the command structure and told him what to do. But in fact, he didn't have the right to do that. Um, so if you were a lieutenant, it doesn't matter what your rank was, you, you, didn't, you couldn't say a word to a Brit on Omaha Beach landing you. Uh, they, they had complete control. 
we we were we were we were numero uno until you guys until the ramp came down and you guys took over. Um, so there have been um, there have been kind of weird and false stories about how you know British guys and British Navy guys um, refuse to go any closer. It's a it's a it's a, it's a famous tall tale from uh, Company B in the 116th where. Um, uh, you know, a guy called Zappa Costa, apparently, a lieutenant called Zappa Costa, apparently had to put a gun, a Colt 45, to a British guy's head to make him go closer to the beach. It's absolute nonsense. There's not one proven proven case of where a limey lap guts on Omar <laughs> Beach landing you guys. But it's interesting to think that that, that that command structure existed. And it was it was like that for a very good reason, which is that, you know, get out of the way. Your guys', is, your guys job is to fight when you get out of the landing craft. Our job is to get you to where you need to fight. And uh, so, yeah, and we did a pretty good job. Nick, Nikki's asking about, uh, are there any particular points of bravery during the landings that stand out to you? You know, we've highlighted a few already, but there's many more in your book. I don't know if you want to highlight some of the other kind of real heroes that made a big difference. Well, I think that uh, glider pilots, um, whether you were British, American or Canadian, uh, crashing a plane into a heavily fortified field in Normandy in the dark. Uh, literally, was, it, it was a suicide mission. And for a lot of those guys, they ended up killing themselves. And actually, the, the guys are behind them in their, in their uh, gliders. So I think that you couldn't pick a, a tougher job than really being a crash, crashing a, a, a wooden glider uh, under enormous uh, stress and often under uh, flat in, intense flak uh, into a field where there were defensive obstacles that, would, that could, could also kill you quickly. So, weren't there like, wasn't Rommel placing stakes in places yeah. where he thought there would be glider landings and they were he's yeah. setting fields and so, I mean, it's not just landing a glider in an in open field. I mean, you've got all these purposes. Yeah, they were, they were, they were called Rommel's, they were called Rommel's asparagus and they, they were slanted like this and they were mined um, barbed wire covered them, etc. So if you looked at all the fields around St. Mary Glees, any, any place you could land a glider, literally that was strategically important, they were full of thousands and thousands and thousands of these so-called Rommel's asparagus. So yeah, if you could find a field to land in where you weren't going to be ripped apart by an 18 foot long hole, you were very fortunate indeed. Yeah. I have, my one relative uh, was an American glider pilot who landed on D plus right. one near St. Mary right. Glees and Glad he made it through, but yeah, it just yeah. sounds harrowing just reading about those those flimsy yeah. gliders and all they had to do. Yeah. Hey, another question. Alex asks, what sparks your interest in studying World War II? You mentioned up in front you have you know family members who were here in Normandy, um, but also maybe I want to kind of tweak the question a bit, Alex, because I know you're working on another new book in the World War II, and maybe uh, you could talk about a little bit about that too. So, what sparked your interest, and then kind of what are you working on next? Well, you know, my granddad um, was a, a local journalist in Worcestershire in England before the Second World War. And he had two very small kids. One of them was my mum. And he served on HMS Tartar as a telegraphist. So he was a, a journalist. I was a journalist too, still am. I'd think, like to think I am anyway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he served on HMS Tartar, which was one of, uh, I think there were 14... Uh, they were the most modern and and swift and lethal uh, destroyers that the Brits made. They were built in the late 1930s, so they were very modern. But they, they were they, our creme de la creme of our destroyer class in the British Navy. And there were 14 built before World War II, and only four were left at the end of the war. One of them was uh, was HMS Tartar, which actually was in action on uh, uh, on D-Day. It supported you guys in the uh, Salerno invasion in September 19. 43 actually supported American invading troops on several occasions uh, during World War II. And my grandfather served on Tata, which was also an escort during the famous Malta convoy runs in 1942. Uh, and he was uh, badly wounded. His ship was sunk and he went into the water. Uh, he was pulled out of the water, put on another boat. This is in the Mediterranean. And uh, that boat was sunk. So he was sunk twice by U boats. Wow. And um, Daddy, get the he had an infection and he got women. gangrene and uh, they chopped his ankle off, chopped his foot off at his ankle and they chopped his leg off at his knee. And then finally, after six months, they went up to as far as they could go and he died of, of uh, complications uh, 
about uh, six months after my mum was born. So my mum doesn't remember it, but she was held by her grandfather, but he died six months later. So that, that's, a, that's a big reason why I'm fascinated by World War II and uh, many others. But to answer the second part of the question, right now I'm writing about several guys from the 3rd Infantry Division who received a Medal of Honor. Um, one of them's uh, Audie Murphy, the most decorated. And I can say this for a f without any hesitation, I'd love to argue about this, but he is the most decorated right. soldier in US history. Uh, absolutely extraordinary story when you really look into it, because he went with the third division from North Africa all the way to Germany. That's 233 days of frontline the combat. combat record. Yeah, and that th they, they, the third division spent longest in combat in Europe, had the highest number of casualties, and the most uh, awards for bravery. So today, Today, we have 40, 40, you can fact check me on this, 40 guys from the third ID that received the Medal of Honor. Almost all of them, obviously, in World War II, but some as recently as, right. uh, one as recently as 2018. I don't think yeah. a lot of people would uh, know that, that the third is, is the division in Europe that has the highest numbers of Medals of Honor recipients. So that is really yeah. Um Maybe our so last question. Our last question, Alex, comes from Daniel, and Daniel's asking about, uh, and you do, a, you do highlight this in the book, about the French underground, or the role of the French kind of in the land. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit about kind of what role they played. Well, actually, there were 177 Frenchmen who actually had the great honor and privilege of invading their homeland. So if you can match these guys, <laughs> they're on a boat off the coast of, of uh, of Normandy. In fact, they were headed with the British commandos towards Wiestraham. Uh, they were called the Kiefer Commando. Uh, amazing guys. I think there are only three of them alive left today. I, I interviewed one of them called Leon Gautier for my book. Uh, he was a, a Frenchman that actually fought and landed in his own country on D-Day. Um, some of those guys had been to Wiestraham before the war because there was a famous casino there. And they didn't know they were arriving at Wiesterham until literally 24 hours before they got there. And the, the jokes went around that, oh my God, I lost, I lost a hell of a lot of money in that casino. I'm gonna have to go and, I'm gonna have to go and take it back. But anyway, it was, a, it was a big deal if you were a Frenchman to be a part of D-Day. Um, and they had a certain, a certain ambivalence because they watched this enormous shell fire and bombing of their own country. And they were gonna have to fight their way through the streets of their own of their own country on, on D-Day, um, but they did so with enormous, enormous pride. I mean, they, they were really kicking the Bosch out of their homeland for good. And uh, it's been a long time since they had been uh, serving and training. Uh, France fell in 1940, so four long years later, these French guys get to go back and, and help liberate their own country and, and, and rid France of Nazism. So yeah, they, the French were extraordinary. They were under the command of the British, yet again, uh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they enjoyed that. I'm sure that was a good relation. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> 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 they behaved themselves impeccably. They took their orders and did a fantastic I don't know, did we job. ask the French, though? <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, they, uh, actually, Leon Gautier is a, an amazing guy. He's alive today. Uh, he's 97 years old. I, I talked to him a few weeks ago. And he lives in Wiestraham. So Wiestraham is where the French uh, commandos fought very intensely that day. And he lives about literally half a mile from where he came ashore on the beach. That's, and a, he, that's amazing. Ten years ago, he used to walk his dog along the beach where he fought every morning, you know? So uh, he's an incredible guy. And uh, he literally lives half a mile from where he, he fought on D-Day. And is, is still, still, uh, still with us. Um, a god in France. Imagine if you're one of the... Imagine if the Americans had come back to America and landed in New Jersey and 177 Yanks got to land on D-Day and begin to liberate North America from Nazism. Imagine today if you were, one of, if you were three, one of the three last guys from those 177, you, you'd be, oh my God, you'd have a, a statue yeah, on the mall. And I think that is, uh, Alex, you know, important. We're really almost at the end of this World War II generation and it's, they've, for those that have lived this long, it's, it's remarkable to still have their legacy and for you to capture their stories and share it. And I think this book, again, 
does a fantastic job of that. And unfortunately, as you point out in, in the book, many of these heroes uh, either don't survive Normandy or Europe or have a very challenging survival back home too. Um, and so it is, you know, there's a certain sadness to that too, for the sacrifice. Yeah, um, but you know, at the same time, I think uh, um, it's important to remember that what they ch achieved was something so immensely, immensely significant. I mean, we have democracies in Western Europe. It's a pretty prosperous place or, or, or was until recently, but the whole world is, is dealing with that issue right now. But um, I'm 54 years old and I grew up in a Europe that was peaceful, that, um, that has now spent the longest period in its history, 76 years since D-Day, um, in peace. That's, that's a, a very long time and it's a significant achievement and it began with the sacrifice of so many lives on D-Day um, in Northwestern Europe anyway. And it's a great achievement both for the Allies and in particular I would say to your audience Americans because that was a great gift over almost um, over two and a half thousand fatalities on D-Day, 20,000 American dead in the Battle of Normandy. We're looking at almost 150,000 Americans killed to liberate Europe as a whole. And it's a, it's a wonderful achievement to liberate that continent from the greatest evil of modern times, from genocide, from, from untold oppression and slavery. Um, we were liberated and the Americans played a very important role in that liberation. And we should never forget that in 1945, the whole world loved you guys. You were, <laughs> you were held in enormous respect. The peak of your moral authority as a nation was in 1944-45 when you won a vicious and bitter and unprecedented global conflict on two fronts in the Pacific and in Europe. So as a European, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alex. I mean, this has been wonderful. I appreciate you sharing all your wisdom and knowledge about this battle and campaign. And as I said, this is a book that really uh, captures a lot of these great heroes. Well worth a read. I thought I knew a lot of things about D-Day, but when I read this, this was really an exciting read. So I hope if you haven't read it, audience, uh, you will. And again, uh, please join us for, for more of these events. Again, you can follow us on the Facebook side or on our website at mohmuseum.org. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was great. Thank you very much.